The supply chain was breaking down before COVID. Now, of course, COVID made it worse, yes. Uh, and the war in Ukraine made it worse yet, yes. But this really started with Trump's trade war in 2018. So um, that, like I said, there's a thread that runs through all these things. So uh, not to throw out my hands, I'm not going to do that. But um, when you ask me that, I'm like, I'm thinking, well, you want to talk about China, Ukraine, supply chain, Biden, they're, they're all they're all a big deal. If, if um, you know, in terms of tragedy, probably uh, the war in Ukraine is the most important because it's highly, highly significant economically and strategically. But of course, it's a human tragedy going with it. You know, if Chinese real estate implodes, okay, there's some hardship here and there, but it's not like uh, people being killed or maimed or forced into refugee status. And that is uh, part of what's going on in Ukraine. So that's a uh, that's probably the biggest single one, but I wouldn't uh, miss the fact that all these learned about inflation, but uh, there's, there's a big backstory there. But I always say when it, when it comes to your own money, everybody has a PhD in economics. You don't need Larry Summers to tell you what's going on with your budget and your you know ability to feed your family or keep a roof over your head. So people get inflation. One of the reasons it's so politically toxic is because it's unavoidable. You can't fudge it. You can't spin it. It's like, hey, if I used to fill up my Ford F-150 truck for 50 bucks and now it's 125 bucks, A, you get it. It's right in your face. And B, that's 75 bucks that you don't have to take your spouse out to dinner, you know, buy a new jacket or whatever. Um, so there's kind of demand destruction at the same time you're spending more money on the one thing you can't do without. So so people get it. But then from there, the question I get the most is, hey, Jim, is this going to cause a recession? Are we going to have a recession? And I use as recently as a few months ago, I would say, yeah, I, I think so. You can see it coming late this year, early next year. Now I say we're in a recession. I mean, it's not coming. We're in it. And, and there's data. I, you know, I never make statements like that, Brian, without supporting it so the the standard definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of declining gdp there are a few more bells and whistles having to do with unemployment and, and a few other things but that's that's the rule of thumb so based on that based on the best available estimate for a second quarter likely to be accurate we're in a recession today now it's not severe but that's like saying I, i'm in bed with a you know pneumonia but i'm not dying well okay but uh we're in a, we're in a recession right now um and there's, there's a lot of whistling past the graveyard. I mean, the stock market uh, is still you know, greatly overpriced. There's still, you know, the buy the dips mentality hasn't gone away. It's still there. You got people like Jim Cramer yelling, you know, buy Netflix or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's institutional support. Uh, there's momentum trading. Of course, 95% of the trading is by robots. So you got to reverse engineer the 27 year olds from Bangladesh who don't get out much. They're the ones really writing these algorithms. I um, mean, brilliant engineers, but you know, you'd have to show them around Wall Street. So, so all that's going on. So we haven't really seen the real, the, the market collapse, stock market collapse that I would expect in association with a severe recession has not happened yet. This is just going to play out. It'll get worse as the year goes on. All right. So you're expecting a major correction in stock markets on yeah, the back I'm of not a recession. Alone. I, mean, I mean, that that is my expectation. I have my own models and I look at it closely. But if you listen to you know, Michael Berry, uh, Jeremy Grantham, uh, you know, Charlie Munger, these people have been around and they, they run, you know, hundreds of billions. Uh, and uh, they're saying the same thing. So, you know, so every now and then someone will throw some statistic at me. And I go, well, how long is your time series? And I go, oh, we took about five years. I was like, you know, talk to me if you've done it for a hundred years, because that's a little more meaningful. But Jeremy Grantham actually did do a 100 year time series and looked at bubbles all over the world, you know, 1929, US, 1989, Japan, 2000, dot com stocks, you know, and, and many others. And he said he's never seen anything like it. You know, it's a triple greatest bubble of all time times three in the sense that it's um, real estate, stocks and, and other asset classes. So, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, that, that is my view, but it's it's shared by a number of other analysts. And that would mean like S&P coming off another 20, 30 y- percent. Yes. Uh, and, and again, you remind you have to remind people. Um, 1929, yeah, everyone's like, yeah, October, uh, I think uh, 18th or 19th, it was late October, 1929, the stock market fell 22% in two days. It wasn't one day, it was you know, it was like 12% one day, 11% the next day, so 23% over two days. But that wasn't the crash. I mean, that was the beginning of the crash. The, the, this, this Dow Jones fell 82% from, from top to bottom. Now it took three years, it, it bottomed in uh, June, 1932. 
uh, started in October 1929, so not quite three years, but uh, that fell 82 percent, and and that happens. So uh, so yeah, we're down. Uh, you know, Nasdaq's down. Uh, I'll bounce back a little bit in recent days. Down close to 30 percent. Down the S&P down over 20 percent. We're in bear market territory, but that that's just the beginning. That's not what a full bear market, full you know market adjustment looks like in the face of the kind of recession that I expect. Talk to me about inflation because you know I was looking at some of the inflation numbers and you have to go back to the 80s to see anything that's approaching double digit. You know I remember being a, just a kid hearing about double digit inflation. I could kind of remember the 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 gas pumps. You know the lines at the gas. It's like a distant memory of me in the 70s. And but you know how do you talk to you know younger people these days about what inflation is or it means because I don't think people really grasp what it actually means to your savings or to the economy in an, even a medium term. Well, that's exactly right, Brian. And if you, um, uh, you know, you're, you're a little younger than I am, but I, I, I lived through it. I was, uh, I started my career uh, in banking in 1976. And uh, so I start. I remember my, uh, my wife and I used to kid each other. She was in advertising, I was in banking and the inflation was so bad, you'd get a raise every like four or five months and you didn't have to ask they would just give it to you because they knew that you were going to quit if, if uh, they didn't keep up so she would get a raise and she was making more than i was at the time so we'd go out to dinner and then i would get a raise and i was making more than she was so we would just tease each other about that but that's how it was and the psychology was you know if you needed a whatever you know a tv set or refrigerator new car whatever you say i better buy it now because the price is going to be higher if i wait a month or two months the price is going to run away from me so it it had huge behavioral uh, effects uh, of course gold was you know going to the moon there, there was a lot going on at the time but but brian you're right when you say we're putting up inflation numbers today that are the highest in 40 years that is correct a little 41 uh, actually it was 1981 before we saw these numbers but i remind people the inflation in 1981 was the end of a 10-year period of inflation. It wasn't the beginning. It's like, oh, that has some inflation. Yeah, we did, but it had started. I mean, some ways it started in 1968 and it really took off in 1974, 75. So 81, these numbers, that was when Volcker finally got it under control. But you go back to 80, 70, you know, 70 well, between 77 and 81, so that five-year period, the dollar lost 50% of its purchasing power. Not 15, 50 uh, in that five year stretch. So you were putting up numbers, you know, 10%, 11%, 13% and higher year after year. Yeah, 1981, it was, um, you know, nine or 10, which is what they're comparing it to today. But that was, I was on the downslope. It had been higher than that in 77, 78, and, and you know, and, and 79. So the question is, is this the beginning of an inflationary surge where it's going to get even worse and it is going to last five years? Or is it is it different than that? But I but keep that in mind because the the forty year comparison it is correct, but that was the tail end of an even worse episode. And again, there is this comparison to the seventies. By the way, I think the situation we're in today is very different from the nineteen seventies, and I'll explain why. In the seventies, it was triggered from the supply side with first the Arab oil embargo in nineteen seventy three as a result of the. Uh, uh, the 1973 Arab-Israeli war, and then the price tripled, but it went from like you know, two dollars to six dollars. Okay, but you know, percentage terms, that's a huge jump, but it was still six dollars, and then it got to twelve, and then in 1979 you had a second oil embargo because of Iran and the Ayatollah and the revolution and the hostages and all that, and then it went from kind of twelve to twenty. So uh, oil went up by a factor of ten. Um, in the course of the late 70s for because there's two different embargoes. So that's coming from the supply side. But what happened was the other source of inflation is on the demand side. So you have what's called cost push inflation. That's where you know supplies choked off or there's an embargo or there's a shortage, natural disaster, a lot of things. It's coming from the supply side and demand is inelastic. So you just pay up or you know kind of do without. But the demand side is much more psychological. That's called uh, demand pull inflation. That's when consumers behave the way I described, and as I said, I lived through the 70s, um, where, you know, hey, I better buy it today, I better buy it now. You're pulling all this demand forward and bidding up prices because you're worried that it's going to get even worse. So as that applies to today, 
we are starting with the cost push inflation, you know, mainly the price of energy, but the price of food is a big factor. And of course they're related. You know, it's like, I was like, here's the energy, here's the food. Yeah, you know, where do you think the food comes from? You, to get the food, you got to feed the pigs and cows. What do you feed them? You feed them corn. Huh, how do you get corn? Well, you grow it on a farm. You need nitrogen fertilizer. You need diesel in your tractors. Uh, you get the food, you got to put it in a truck to get it from point A to point B. That requires diesel. The higher the diesel price, the higher the cost of food because you're moving it by truck, et cetera. So these things, as I say, are linked. But, but food prices are going up substantially and you can't, the two things you can't do without are gas in the car and food. So, so you have that cost push inflation. The thing I would point out is that um, there are bull markets and bear markets and uh, in basically any tradable instrument or commodity or uh, I consider gold to be a form of money. But what we're really talking about when we say, you know, gold is up, what we're talking about the dollar price of gold. And I view it as a cross exchange rate. People talk about the dollar, you know, the euro dollar exchange rate. Well, there's a dollar gold exchange rate, and that's the dollar price of gold. Uh, so there's just alternative forms of money where people get to express a liquidity preference or uh, a credit preference, if you will, if you're concerned about the, um, if you're losing confidence in the dollar. But the first great bull market was um, 1971 to 1980. Uh, it lasted nine years, and gold went up 2,000. 200 um, percent. The second great bull market was from uh, 1999 to 2011. Gold went up at just a little under 700 uh, percent. But um, in between, you had a bear market from 1980 to 1999. It's a long one, uh, you know, almost 20 years. Gold dropped from $800 to $250 at the bottom in 1999. And we had a second bear market starting in 2011. Now, I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Jim Rogers. Um, you know, Jim is one of the great commodity traders, uh, money managers of all times. And um, we were down in the uh, Dominican Republic at the Casa de Campa. This is around 2014. But, you know, the, the bear market started in 2011, but it really fell off a cliff in 2013. So I said, Jim, you know, what, what do you think of gold? What are you doing? He goes, well, I own it, of course. And he said, I'm not selling, but I'm not buying right here. And he said something that just hit me right between the eyes and it stayed with me. And of course, he's right. He said, gold's going to the moon, but nothing goes to the moon without a 50% correction along the way. And if you look at the high in 2011, $1,900, you know, approximately, and where was the bottom of the of the bear market? It was $1,050 on December 16, 2015. Nobody knew it was the bottom at the time. But if you look at that drop down and you, you use $250 as your base, because you know you need a base. So you had uh, basically a uh, 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 the run from 250 to 1900 uh, was $1,750. Go down 50% from there, it's $825. 1900 minus 825 is 1075, and the bottom was 1050. So, so Jim totally stuck the landing. Like a 1050, like, okay, there's your 50% retracement. Now that's the bottom. Now it's going up, and the sky's the limit. Well, we're not overheated at all. And I've got gold at, uh, I would put it at $15,000 an ounce before 2025. But as I point out, if you're going to $15,000 an ounce, you got to get to $3,000, $5,000, $7,000 $7, first. So there's plenty of room to run, plenty of room for profits. But you know, when I say things like that, I want to be clear. There's a lot of analysis behind it. I don't just pull a big number out of the air and you know for publicity because I could care less. But if you just took the average, and there are a couple ways to think about it. Just take the average of the two prior bull markets I mentioned. So 71 to 80, nine years, 2,200%, 99 to 2011, a 12-year bull market, um, about 700%. Just take the average. You don't have to go to the higher of the two or extrapolate. Just take the average of those two bull markets. You would say, okay, well, the next bull market is going to be a little over 10 years, and it's going to go up um, – it's going to go up 1,500%. So using that as your base, just take the average of the two. You say, all right, 10 years from 2015, that puts you out to 2025. And at you know, 1,400%, it puts you at $15,000 an ounce off a 1050 base. So that's just that's just history. But there are other ways to think about it. Now, um, you know, I don't know if there'll be a gold standard or not, but I do know that gold will move, the price of gold will move in the direction of where it would need to be if you're going to have a gold standard. And you know, I talked to Paul Volcker about this and, and he agreed. You, um, uh, if you just took the money supply, so just take M, M1, which is you know pretty widely accepted definition of uh, money supply. Take it for the US, the ECB, UK, Bank of Japan, and People's Bank of China. There are other 
entities you could include, but that's that's about that's over 75% of global GDP right there. Uh, divide that number by the official goal, which is about 34,000 metric tons, a little bit less. You come to $15,000 an ounce. So uh, if you're if you're going to either have a gold standard or even use gold as a reference point for money, uh, if you if you need to restore confidence in the dollar, the implied non-deflationary price is fifteen thousand dollars now. So what I find interesting is that if you use the just the history of the last two bull markets and average them, or if you use you know a rigorous calculation, what's the what's the implied non-deflationary price? Interestingly, they come out in the same place. I don't think they have to. They're two different methods, but they both point to $15,000 an ounce sometime over the next three or four years. If it is a moving target, the numbers I gave you are based on current levels, but if you keep printing money, you need a higher price to, if you want to reference gold and not cause deflation, which they don't, you're going to need a progressively higher price of gold. One thing people forget, um, you know, they tend they look at the dollar price in absolute dollars. So it went up $100 an ounce, or, you know, I expect before long it'll go up thousand dollars an ounce a week but each dollar increase is a smaller percentage increase so people look at the dollar yeah, it's real money it's nice to make the money but you know if you go from uh fourteen thousand dollars an ounce to fifteen thousand dollars an ounce that's only a seven percent increase i mean that's you can do that in a week so so my point is it's still a thousand dollars an ounce good for the holders but the the percentage increase gets smaller and smaller as the absolute dollar amount gets larger and larger so fifteen thousand dollars sounds like a big number from today's perspective but as you go to 10 11 12 it gets to be a progressively smaller percentage increase and therefore more likely you really you need to see it logarithmically to see it you know a less hyperbolic curve so logarithmically is the right way to think about it but in dollar terms the percentage increase gets to be pretty small at those levels. And uh, when I say $15,000 down, I don't think I'm stretching. I mean, could, could it be 25000 40000 I mean, just take my, my monetary equivalent. If you use M2, and by the way, my when I said, when I used M1 and did that math, that's with 40% backing, because historically 40% has been a high level of backing. If you take M2 at 100% backing, you get to 50000 an ounce in a heartbeat. My numbers, I think, are conservative. They could be much higher. But the thing I would point out is that the, the Fed dug a hole and they can't get out of it. And I said in, uh, you know, well, all along, but certainly, you know, 2014, 2015, et cetera, as they did the taper and then they did the liftoff and then they raised rates and all that. I said the Fed is trying to get out of this. They're trying to normalize the balance sheet, trying to normalize interest rates. But I also said they won't be able to do it. And that's exactly what happened in the fourth quarter of 2018 between October 1st and December um, uh, 24th, 2018, the stock market dropped 19%. It was one point away from a bear market at that stage. And then you had the Christmas Eve massacre. And that's when Jay Powell threw in the towel. He got religion. He said, okay, first he said, we're not going to raise rates anymore. Then he said, we're on pause. Then he said, we're actually going to cut rates. And then nine months later, he said, we're going to end quantitative tightening, which was reducing the balance, the, the, the money supply. And then in September... Uh, 2019, they started QE4, which is the, that was before any of the, before the recession, before the depression, before the pandemic, they were already in QE4 and uh, cutting rates again. So th they can't get out of it. Now it's worse. So they prove that the, the failure is manifest. They prove that they can't get out of it. Uh, and, what, and, and, and what can they do? By the way, on, on monetary theory, I mean, they say, what's the secret behind mon I think it's garbage, by the way, but you say, what's the secret behind it? Well, the secret behind it is if you can issue debt and collect taxes in the money that you print, you can force people to accept the money because they need the money to pay their taxes. And if they don't pay the taxes, they end up in jail. Now you can, you can, you know, get extensions or you know do whatever. But at the end of the day, if you manifestly refuse to pay your taxes, they will come and uh, and put you in jail. And and the point is, it relies on state power. It's really a neo-fascist concept. It relies on coercion you know, the point of a gun, jails and state power to enforce the confidence in money. Now that's, and they say that, I mean, I've, I've read Stephanie Kelton, she's the bright light. I mean, this goes back a long way, but I've met her, read her books and, and uh, her book, I should say, and her articles, uh, but they're very explicit about that. Now, I think that's completely wrong because there are so many workarounds and so many ways to get out from under that kind of state power, but they do rely on state power at the end of the day. So that's why it has this, this neo-fascist element. Powell did not say 
we're going to raise rates until core PC is 2%. He didn't say that. What he said was, we're going to raise rates until it's acting in a restrictive way on inflation and inflation will come down on its own because rates will be higher and high enough to cause that. At which point we will, we, the Fed will pause. And then you say, well, when are you going to cut rates? He was like, the, the pause could be a year. So there, you're talking, 20, forget this Fed pivot nonsense. I mean, you're talking 2024, if then, before they cut rates. But in the meantime, um, so they've got to get rates high enough. So they're going to go, you know, well, 75 basis points in November, December, who knows? We'll, we'll know closer to the date. It'll either be 50 or 75, you know, some talk about 50, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it, it it's going up, probably going to go up. You know, I have the calendar for 2023. There's a meeting February 1st and another one in uh, late March, I think March 22nd. They'll probably raise up both of those. They're going to get rates up to five, five-ish. Um, at that point, they probably will have achieved the goal of bringing core PCE down, but they will also have destroyed the economy in the process. It's like I remember in, in Vietnam, the old saying, you know, we had to, we had to, this is uh, the latest and long string of uh, Fed blunders since uh, 1913, seems to be their specialty, but that's what they're doing. They, they could, uh, they could uh, at least pause now maybe even cut rates if 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 everything i said is correct and obviously i think it is or i wouldn't be saying it but if we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis as revealed by the euro dollar futures curve and the treasury yield curve and you know uh, negative swap spreads and uh, treasury bill auctions with the yield of maturity below what the fed will give you for a phone call i mean all those things are happening that's hard data uh, and it's a very, very uh, troubling sign, last seen in 2008, by the way, before the two, before the Lehman Brothers meltdown. If all that's happening and the fundamental signs are also weak, which we just saw in third quarter GDP, which is based on net exports, which won't last. How, how are you going to drive a trade surplus with, with the strongest dollar in 20 years? Good luck with that. I mean, nobody can afford our stuff and we're not buying anybody else's stuff. So with the economy going into a recession on its own, with a global liquidity crisis brewing, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? You know, when I when I talked to my editor about this, you know, go back a year ago, so in November 2021, you know, every headline you looked at, website, commentary, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain is breaking down. There's no, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they couldn't get cream cheese to make uh, make cheesecakes uh, at Junior's, you know, the world's, world's most famous cheesecake place. Um, you know, and on and on and on, like a, a long list. And then last spring was the, the baby formula shortage, which is actually was serious. I mean, mothers couldn't feed their children. So it was very bad. But I found some really, really interesting research that because uh, everyone says, well, yeah, COVID messed it up and the war in Ukraine messed it up. Well, that's true, but it didn't start there. This started in 2018 with Trump's tariffs because when, and I, I'm not here to debate the tariffs. I actually think the tariffs were a good idea, but that was the start of the supply chain breakdown because when Trump put tariffs on, started with uh, appliances, you know, washing machines, refrigerators and stuff, and then solar panels, and then, you know, technology, and then they just kept piling on. But, but you have to look at what China did in response. China, the US and Brazil are the two largest exporters to soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. Mm -hmm. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it, make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want, we gotta buy the soybeans anyway, why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S.-China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil, stopped buying U.S. soybeans. Well, <laughs> that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, agriculture, you know, trucks. How do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil. All of a sudden, you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we started selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now, but now instead of shipping them from like Port of LA to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationships and they break down. It's not, it's not that it's the end of the supply chain. 
So there's nothing new about supply chains. We can document to the Bronze Age. What was new beginning around 1989 was supply chain science. The combination of vastly improved computing power, artificial intelligence, new algorithms, and more sources of data that could be put together and used by experts to to optimize and make the supply chains more efficient. That was new. And it kind of began with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, you know, Berlin Wall fell in 1989, Soviet Union uh, uh, dissolved uh, in 1991. I talked to the guy who, you know, like this is a worldwide endeavor, but he was probably the single most responsible individual for all the significant developments in the supply chain in the last 30 years. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not going to come back overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take 10 years or more to rebuild it. And what I talk about in the book is supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to uh, 2019. And then supply chain 2.0, which kind of starts now but it's going to go indefinitely because it's going to take a long time to put this together. It's, uh, you know, it's like dropping a vase and it breaks in a, a thousand pieces. You can't put it back together. You got to go buy a new vase. And that's what's going on with the supply chain. The, there will be a supply chain. There always is. But the new supply chain will look very different from what we've just come through. Because the whole the whole 30 years of period I'm describing was built on efficiency. You know, lower cost, lower cost, lower cost. It was kind of the Walmart model. So, yeah, just-in-time inventory. Everyone knows about that. But there's something called cross-docking. That's where a truck pulls up at a warehouse and you unload it. Instead of putting the stuff in the warehouse, you move it to another truck that then goes to a destination. The stuff never goes in the warehouse. Inventories are very expensive. They're they're they're, they're costly to finance. You got to move the stuff around. It's called picking. You know, pick the stuff off the shelf with you. I used to drive a forklift, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, you know, and put it on a truck. You send a lot of trucks too. So, you know, hey, I've got seven suppliers. Why don't I cut it down to three and do bigger contracts with each one and get lower unit costs? I've got five transportation lanes. Why don't I cut that down to two? Get everything to you know Los Angeles and Seattle, as the case may be, you know, et cetera. And they, they did it for three, and they got costs lower, you know. And and Walmart and Amazon were the champions of this, but everyone else was doing it. But they missed something. What they missed was that they're while they were getting those unit unit costs lower for consumers, they there were hidden costs, and the main hidden cost was you you were creating greater frailty. This whole system was subject to a massive massive breakdown. So, uh, you know, what happens if you have two suppliers and they both go on strike? What happens if you have one port of entry and it's backlogged? What happens if you've got uh, quest docking in warehouses and there aren't enough trucks? We need 80,000 drivers, 80,000 drivers. Wish they'd hire them instead of these IRS agents. But the point being, um, it, it is breaking down all across the board. Now, will it, it can it be put back together? Yes, but the biggest difference between 2.0 and 1.0 uh, and this goes by different names. Uh, you know, Johnny Allen called it friendshoring, and Macron called it a constellation of nations. Uh, I, I use the term a college of nations, you know, collegial club, if you will. So you'll still have trading partners, you'll still have outsourcing, you'll still have transportation lanes, but it'll be members only. It'll be basically democratic, kind of liberal republics, Western Europe, uh, you know, the EU, of course, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Uh, you know, and, and some others, India, we expect to be included, Fri friendly nations, but China's out. We're decoupling from them. They're decoupling from us. This isn't U.S. driven. The U.S. is participating, but this is what China wants too. Both sides are decoupling as fast as they can. China can develop its own network, you know, maybe Central Asian Republic, some Southeast Asian um, you know, suppliers and so forth, but they're going to lose customers. Well, most of their customers actually in, in the United States, we won't buy their stuff and we won't sell them our stuff, particularly high tech stuff. So you, the world's going to break and, and these new clubs are going to be formed and there will be trade and there will be transportation lanes, but it'll be much more restrictive. Now, will prices be a little higher? Yes, but it'll be more secure. So the way I describe that you know, if you buy uh, insurance on your house or I buy insurance on my house, you don't want your house to burn down. You hope it doesn't. But if it does, you don't think your insurance premiums are a waste of money. Like when you write that check, you're like, that's money well spent. When you pay higher prices for consumer goods, the, the delta between the old price and the new price is your insurance premium for a more reliable system. 
And also, there's a big national security component to this. It's going to get worse. Inflation is here to stay. Um, commodities are going to boom. Oil prices are going to soar. Bonds are going to crash. And gold has been in a very funny situation, which is the following. Normally, you say, well, if there's inflation coming, why isn't the price of gold going to the moon? And why on earth would gold prices go up if there were deflation or disinflation? The answer is that you have to look at the yield of maturity on the 10-year treasury note. That's our benchmark security. Um, a lot of people look at LIBOR, but I'm like, no, if you're making investment decisions, you're buying a house, you're doing capital investing, these are all five, 10, sometimes 20 year decisions. The 10 year note is the right benchmark for those large long-term investments. Um, well, that's an alternative for August of 2020 is as the yield to maturity on the 10 year note goes up, it, that strengthens the dollar and gold prices have gone down because the dollar price of gold is just another cross rate, just another cross exchange rate. So a stronger dollar means a lower dollar price for gold. But if the yield of maturity in the 10 year note goes down, then that weakens the dollar and the dollar price of gold goes up because a weaker dollar means a higher dollar price for gold. So curiously, the price of gold is being driven not by inflation in the abstract, but by the strength of the dollar, which is reciprocal to the interest rate on the 10 year treasury notes. But here's what has changed. I talk about gold bull markets and gold bear markets, and I start my analysis in 1971, and I don't have to go through all, the, all that data, but that's, that's how I think about it. And you're like, well, Jim, why 1971? Why not before that? And of course, 1971, it was when Nixon stopped redeeming dollars for gold. Americans couldn't even own gold in 1971. It was contraband. It was like drugs or you know machine guns or something. But foreign trading partners could redeem dollars for gold up until 1971. And then Nixon said, no more. And then that was the final decoupling. But prior to that, gold was actually money. In other words, uh, with under Bretton Woods, gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. Prior to Bretton Woods, it was pegged at $20.67 an ounce. We've gone back to the 1920s or earlier through most of the 19th century. For the United States and sterling, I think it was $4.75. It could be off a little bit on that, but it was four, four pounds and, and change. And as late as World War I, say 1913, if you were a Brit and you were getting on the steamer from London to you know, at the time, Bombay, today, Mumbai, you took a purse of uh, British sovereigns. British sovereign is, is about uh, about eight grams, a little bit less. You know, it's not an ounce, it's a quarter ounce because an ounce is almost too much. Even even today, what are you gonna do with a one ounce coin? It's worth, you know, almost $2,000. Uh, you know, you're not gonna use that for to buy a pack of gum. But in the day, there was the quarter ounce, which today would be, you know, like a $500 bill. So it's still a significant amount of money. Uh, but you could get on the steamer in Southampton and get off in Bombay at the time, and it was money good. You could take that British sovereign and spend it anywhere. And same thing in Singapore and Hong Kong and Japan or all around the world. So gold was actually money. So it wasn't a question of, oh, what's the exchange rate? It was the gold was the money. And people thought about it by weight. They said, oh, a sovereign, that's eight grams of gold. So that's worth, you know, that'll get you whatever. So, uh, and that was true throughout history. And so it's really only since 1971, when we decoupled completely in terms of an exchange rate that you have to think about, you know, well, what's the dollar price of gold? Because it's not fixed. But okay, well, what happened to the memory? What happened to the 3000 years I just talked about? Well, the answer is it happened in stages and it actually took, it took about 75 years. So it began in 1914. 1914 was the outbreak of World War I. Everybody needed gold. There was a, there was a run on gold um, and countries needed gold because they knew they would need gold to pay for the war to try to win the war. Whether it didn't matter if you're Germany, UK or whoever. And remember the United States was neutral. The United States did not get in the war until 1917. The war started in 1914. So for those first two and a half years, New York was a money center to all of Europe, to, to all the belligerents. Uh, so everyone scrambled for gold. So if you were a citizen, they asked you to bring your gold to the bank and they gave you paper money. And but people did it out of a patriotic, it's existential. War is not a normal market. You're gonna, if you lose the war, you got bigger problems than your gold. And so people put the gold in the banks. What did the banks do? 
they melted it down and made 400 ounce bars. And they said, don't worry, your money's backed by the gold, but keep using that paper money, uh, but it's redeemable for gold. But oh, by the way, they're 400 ounce bars. Nobody walks around with a 400 ounce bar in her purse. I'm sure you've seen one and I have as well. They're, they're heavy, they weigh about 35 pounds. You don't walk around with them. So all of a sudden the, the gold was still there and the paper money was backed by gold in theory, but the gold had disappeared into the banks. That's step one. Step two, and this happened in the 1930s, the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks. So first the commercial banks took the gold from the people. Then the central banks took the gold from the commercial banks and the Federal Reserve System sold all the banks. Hey, send your, send your gold to the regional Federal Reserve Bank. And of course, most of it went to the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. So now it's not even in the banks anymore, right? But you're still walking around thinking your paper money is somehow attached to gold, but people haven't seen gold for a while, uh, unless you're a collector. Step three, uh, the United States Treasury and the finance ministries took it from the central bank. The 1934, the United, the United States Treasury seized the gold of the Federal Reserve System. Bearing in mind, the Federal Reserve System is privately owned. And they gave them a gold certificate. And you go to the Federal Reserve System website today and you know hunt around a little bit on the links and find the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and it's there. And look on the look in the assets and the first line item is gold certificate and it's valued at 11 billion dollars but that's because they value the gold at 42 dollars an ounce if you and i've revalued it the answer is that today's market that that 11 billion is actually worth 470 billion so the fed has a hidden asset of 450 odd billion that's not on the balance sheet represented by a gold certificate but it's not the gold the treasury has the gold and by the way, where do we keep our gold? I'm talking about the United States. The Treasury owns the gold. The Fed has a paper certificate. The gold is on two army bases, West Point and Fort Knox. So I would say the army has the gold. Gold has gone from citizens walking around having it in, in your purse to commercial banks, to central banks, to finance ministries held on an army base. It's still there. The gold didn't disappear, um, but nobody talks about it. And everyone pretends it's not money, but of course it's money. Um, but but meanwhile, what's happened to this, the, the civilian population, the citizens? We stopped talking about it. We stopped saying it. We stopped learning about it. I remind people, I, I'm just showing my age, but my I got a graduate degree in international economics and I was class of 74. But that was the year the IMF demonetized gold. But I was the last class that was taught gold in an academic setting as a monetary asset. Uh, if you know if you're younger than I am and you know anything about gold, you're either self-taught or you went to mining college because they just stopped teaching it. So now we have two generations of scholars who never learned a thing about gold. So they they hit it, they took it, they buried it, they stopped teaching it, they stopped talking about it, and they pretended it's not there. Meanwhile, it is there. And Russia is a good example of someone who takes it seriously in the US. We still have our 8,000 tons, 8,133 tons. We haven't given it away. We haven't sold any gold since 1980, by the way. We got the British to do it. We got everyone else to do our dirty work. The British sold more than half, no, seriously, the British sold more than half their gold. The Swiss sold 1,000 tons. The IMF sold uh, 400 tons in 2010. That was the last significant sell by a, a, you know, a monetary institution. Uh, Australia sold most of theirs. Canada sold most of theirs. Uh, if I were one of these other countries, I would say to the U.S., hey, why don't you sell some of your gold? But the U.S. doesn't. We haven't sold it now since 1980. You know, we got through 1998. We got through the dot-com crash. We got through 2008. We got through 2020 and COVID. Uh, there was a, actually a good size uh, market drawdown in 2018 between October 1st, 2018 uh, and Christmas Eve, what I call the Christmas Eve massacre. Stock markets dropped 20% in, uh, in under three months uh, when the Fed kept raising interest rates, even though the economy was weakening. So they have seen those, but every single time it came back, even in COVID, uh, March, April, 2020, the stock market went down 30%. It did. I mean, just almost straight down. But by September, we were back to new all-time highs. And so it's not that they've never seen that kind of volatility, but they learned the wrong lesson, which is it always comes back. And we know why, because the Fed bails you out. The Fed floods the zone with money. The Fed talks it up, you know, et cetera. But the, the counter example in 1929, when the stock market did crash, it was down 23% over two days. It was like a 12% day 
and an 11% day in uh, late October 1929, but it kept going. <laughs> the stock market crashed in October 1929, but it bottomed in June 1932. That was a three year moving crash or rolling crash, whatever you want to call it, with some rallies along the way. And the total uh, damage was over 80%, not 30%, not 40%, down 80%. And what people don't know, uh, many people don't know, is you said, okay, you know, then, then it rallied in 1933 and 1934. The Fed messed up again and blundered again, as they usually do in 1937 and threw us into a double dip. But if you ask people, okay, well, everyone knows the stock market crashed in 1929. When did it regain those highs? How long did that take? The answer is 25 years. It was 1954 before right. the market recovered from 1929. Now, it doesn't mean there weren't gains along the way or you couldn't make money. You could. But if you say, oh, I'll just sit tight and wait till it comes back. Well, a lot of people didn't live long enough. They never saw their, their money back because they didn't live 25 more years. So that's a real bear market. It's happened before. And the, the point is uh, you need to be prepared for things like that. And there are no one alive, but very few people alive. Have, have seen anything like that. And if you say, well, what if we had another market crash right now? We'll talk about reasons why in a second. Um, why could the Fed just come right back in and, you know, print some more money and do the same thing over again and bail out the new failures, whoever they may be? Yeah, you, know, you can just kind of keep bailing things out. Why not do it again? You know, what's the what's the big deal? Well, the answer is each bailout is bigger than the one before. And that's the point. You can go all the way back 1994, Mexico, 1998, Russia, LTCM, 2000, dot com, 2008, Lehman, 2020, pandemic. And they do bail out, but each one's bigger than the one before. I mean, we threw out six or seven trillion dollars of new debt on top of a one trillion dollar a year baseline, seven trillion dollars in new debt to kind of dig our way out of uh, of 2020. So there is a, there is a limit. There comes a time it's like, hey, this, this bail is going to be 20 trillion you know sorry that's uh, that check's too big we're gonna have to let some things fail so what could happen um the the first thing on my list is uh we're heading for a very uh severe recession i just want to uh, kind of explain briefly the dynamics of that so the fed's raising interest rates we know that they started you know it, so it wasn't that long ago but march 1st 2022 the fed policy rate was zero it was zero percent uh, people remember Paul Walker. Oh, Paul Walker raised interest rates to 20%. Well, he did, but so far Powell hasn't raised them as high, but he's raised them fast. I mean, even when Volcker was working his way to 20%, it took three years from 1979 to 1982. So Powell's plan is clear because he's told us. He said inflation is job one. You know, it's not that we don't care, but unemployment is going to go up. We're going to have a recession. He doesn't use the R word, by the way, but it's implicit in everything he says. We are going to have a recession. Unemployment is going up. And too bad. It's kind of too bad because we got to get inflation under control. And so the Fed is in search of something that they call the terminal rate. What's the terminal rate? The terminal rate is a rate that's high enough to bring inflation down on its own without further hikes. So it doesn't have to be higher than inflation. It has to be high enough to cause inflation to come down to the Fed's goal of 2% without hiking more. And when they get there to that terminal rate, they'll sit tight, they call it the pause. And the pause could be a year. And Powell said this, again, this is right out of his script. So um, Powell's in search of the terminal rate. By the way, if you said to me, hey Jim, what's the terminal rate? I would answer truthfully, I would say, I don't know, but neither does Jay Powell. Jay Powell doesn't know what the terminal rate is. He's, he's kind of saying, we'll know it when we see it, but we're not there yet and we're gonna keep going. And um, they, they have what they call the DOTS, silly name, but the members of the Board of Governors and the Federal Reserve Bank presidents give estimates or the, you know, their estimates of unemployment, inflation, growth, and interest rates for the next three years. Uh, and they put them as dots on a chart, so they call it the dots. Uh, and then, you know, Wall Street gets the dots, they do a central tendency and regressions and all this stuff. One of the top Fed insiders, like, practically sits in Jay Powell's lap and has, all the way back to Bernanke and Yellen, told me personally, he said, inside the Fed, they regard the dots as a joke. They're not better than guesses. Their forecasting ability is dismal. You or I would have better forecasts. And they wish they could get out of it, but they don't know how. So that's the truth, but the problem is, Wall Street and the financial media and the talking heads on CNBC, they want to talk about the dots and it does affect market behavior. So even though it's a joke, 
even though the forecasts are terrible, you have to pay attention because it affects the markets. And if you're affecting the markets, and you're on the wrong side, you're going to get run over. So I look at the dots, not because I put weight on them as predictive analytic tools, but because the market pays attention. The market says, hey, inflation is already coming down. And so the market says, hey, you did it. You're, you know, you're already there. Inflation is coming down. Why don't you stop? And by the way, you're going to get the message. The economy is going to be slowing down. Inflation is going to be coming down. And then you're going to cut rates. This is the famous pivot. Whenever you hear of the Fed pivot, that's when the Fed turns around and starts cutting rates instead of raising them. And that'll be just in time and growth will slow, but it won't be too bad. And we'll come in for a soft landing. And this is the Goldilocks scenario. Uh, so again, typical Wall Street, get the pom-poms out. The Fed's going to cut rates and so buy stocks. That's all Wall Street knows is buy stocks. But the conundrum is, is inflation coming down because the Fed is still hiking? Or is the inflation coming down because they're at the terminal rate? Well, we don't know. It's kind of hard to sort those things out. Powell would say, yeah, it's coming down. I know that, of course, but I got it. It's because I'm hiking and I'm going to keep doing it. My view is, no, you're, you actually did it. It's mission accomplished. You just don't know it. That means, as usual, they're going to screw it up. They're going to blunder. They're going to go too far. And the, it's not going to be a mild recession. It's not going to be Goldilocks. In this version, Goldilocks gets eaten by the bears. In other words, you're going to throw this economy into a very deep recession because you're going to go too far, as usual. And you're not going to know it until uh, too, too late. By the time you realize You've, it's mission accomplished. You will have gone too far, too long. Rates are going to be too high. And it's not going to be a soft landing. If Wall Street's talking up the stock market based on the soft landing Goldilocks scenario, but Powell's going to stick to his guns and, and, and raise rates too high, that's going to cause stocks to crash very severely, very suddenly. If, if the market were adjusting, say, yeah, Powell means it, uh, he's going to keep it, and we ought to come down a little bit. That would be one thing, but that's not what's happening. The market's trying to rally. Powell's warning people what's going to happen they're not listening and it is going to happen people hear the government say you know the economy's fine or you know unemployment's near an all-time low which is actually statistically is is true and they they kind of nod and go yeah it's all good and then reality is the stuff that hits you in the head like a two by four you know the propaganda is um positive we can talk about that in a little more detail the reality is harsh um and reality wins um and there's a very good book um, on this um, by Robert Schiller, a uh, Nobel Prize winning economist at Yale University. I'm not a huge fan of your garden variety PhD economist, but there are some good ones out there. And he's one of them. He wrote a book about, oh, two years ago, maybe a little bit less, called Narrative Economics. Uh, he said, yeah, we got all the models and uh, Phillips Curve and uh, Wealth Effect and uh, uh, you know various you know quantity theory of money. And, you know, some have a place, some are more valuable than others. But uh, don't underestimate the power of a narrative. A narrative is a story. It's basically a, it's a fancy name for a story, but a story that, that persists, that grows. Uh, and interestingly, in epidemiology, of course, we've just come through a pandemic. There's a model called the SEIR model that stands for susceptible. Are you susceptible to a virus? E for exposed. Are you exposed to it? I, are you infected? Did you get it? And R, did you recover? Um, the difference between I and R are people who died. But it's it's a model and it's mathematically based and it's empirically validated of how viruses spread exponentially. And you can also use it to forecast how a virus is going to go. Well, what Schiller did, he took that model, moved it over to economics um, and took a narrative kind of like a virus, not in a negative sense, but just to something that spreads. And uh, it can be very powerful and then eventually may die out or reverse, but it can be powerful in the meantime. Um, that much I knew, but what I learned from the book that I hadn't really thought about is that narratives don't have to be true. They can be true and they can be very powerful, but a narrative can be false and still be powerful. If it's the self-fulfilling prophecy, if enough people believe it, it sort of becomes the reality to some extent, even if it's based on false premises. He gives an example during the Great Depression. The Great Depression really was two technical recessions, but there was a period from 1929 to 1933, uh, election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And then there was another period from 1933 to 1937, 
the 37 and 1940 part, we believe, aside for this purpose. But during the first part of the Great Depression, you know, unemployment was high, uh, output was dropping, trade was dropping. It was a very, very bad time, no doubt about it. But not everybody was out of work. Not everybody was poor. There were a lot of people with a lot of money uh, at the time. But it was felt that being ostentatious was poor form. It's like, you know, okay, I'm lucky I have a job. I've got some money, but I'm not going to buy a new car, or buy a big house or flash it around or whatever, because it's really not considerate of all the people who actually are have fallen on hard times. Well, that was the narrative, but it's the worst possible economic advice because it's precisely the fact that people with the money should keep spending that kind of can boost the economy out of the depression. So by people saying, well, even though I have the money, I'm not going to spend it because it's poor form, uh, we're actually prolonging the Great Depression. Now, when FDR came along, 19, he was elected in 1933, became president in 1934, the psychology turned 180 degrees, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the Democratic campaign saw was happy days are here again, and you know, FDR seemed to solve the banking crisis and so forth. And all of a sudden, it became okay to spend money. Well, in the middle of the Great Depression, 1934 to 1936, those were some of the strongest years ever for the stock market. And unemployment did come down a lot. Now, the problem is it came down from like 25% to 15%. Well, 15% is still you know, painfully high, but it was a, a big move in the right direction. So he, he describes how the narrative flip from don't spend money, it's poor form to, yeah, go spend money and help the economy. None of that is taught in, in business school. It's not taught in economics. It can be modeled using this epidemiology model, but it doesn't fit into any of the standard uh, macroeconomic models, but it's powerful stuff. And so today what's going on is that the White House is trying to push a narrative and they're failing badly. But they'll say, if you listen to deliberations among White House officials, you know, some of the stuff leaks to the press and some, I know some of these people, it's like the economy's great, unemployment's really low. Um, it, it's, we've created all these jobs since the pandemic, but we're doing a really bad job of messaging. The point is they're inside the White House, they're frustrated that the positive economic story is not getting out. The, the correct analysis is that there is no positive economic story. The economy is in terrible shape. The problem is not the messaging, it's the message. Uh, you, and this is why I say the propaganda from the White House of things are great is at odds with the reality, which is things are not great. Let me give you some specific data points, because as I say, I don't like to make statements like this without backing it up. Number one, the inflation was going up long before the war in Ukraine started. So you, the, if everything, was great until February 27th, and then Russia invades, and then all of a sudden the inflation goes up. All right, let's talk about it. But that's not true. This this inflation goes back to uh, late 2021. It was persistent in the fall. We all remember the Fed and the Treasury saying transitory, transitory, transitory. And then finally, I think Jay Powell was testifying before Congress. He said, it's time to retire the word transitory. So that was his way of throwing in the towel. And Janet Yellen admitted she was mistaken also. Um, so it predates the war, number one. Number two, oh, gee, energy prices are going up because there's a war with Russia. Well, uh, I wonder why that is. Well, the reason uh, is not because Putin invaded Ukraine. It's because the U.S. counterattacked with financial sanctions. Now, bear in mind, go, go back to January 21st, 2021, when Biden was sworn in as president and then went back to the White House. What was the first thing he did? He closed the Keystone XL pipeline. This is a pipeline that would bring oil from Alberta, Canada into the United States, where it would connect at a hub, uh, I believe it's in Kansas, but you know, somewhere in the central United States. And then the hub distributes it to the entire country. So he shut down that pipeline, uh, which curtailed the supply of oil from Canada. Then uh, ended new leasing, uh, oil and gas exploration leasing of federal lands, handicapped the fracking industry, took a number of other steps using environmental tools, climate alarm, government subsidies, et cetera, to basically, to the extent possible, shut down the U.S. energy industry as much as possible. Now, you can't shut down completely, of course, but everything happens at the margin. And then we end up with you know, oil prices doubling or tripling, really, from $40 to $120 in, in under a year, which is comparable to what happened in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo. And then Biden wakes up and says, huh, 
guess we need more oil. And uh, he, so he wants to reopen leasing. I said, they shut it down. They did, but he wants to reopen it. He's begging Saudi Arabia to pump more. Saudi Arabia is kind of not returning his phone calls. He's begging Venezuela to pump more. Oh, great. The greatest pariah dictator in the Western Hemisphere. And we're begging him for oil. So why don't we drill our own oil? Because uh, we were a net exporter up until 2021. And then Biden came in and we lost that edge and became a net importer, including recently buying oil from Russia. They curtailed that for political reasons, but that's kind of where we got to. Uh, so you wonder why the price of energy is going up. In other words, this damage was self-inflicted, but don't be misled by the headlines because they're, again, this narrative, but they're, they're not actually uh, doing it. So the point being, the price increase and the inflation in the U.S. has very little to do with Putin and everything to do with the U.S. handicapping its own energy industry, um, begging dictators for oil, uh, and the influence of the climate alarmists. And by the way, that whole crowd uh, want higher gas prices. They want gas to be seven, eight, nine dollars a gallon because they expect that that will accelerate the transfer to electric vehicles and make the electric vehicle more attractive relative to the internal combustion engine. Now that's another fantasy. It, it won't happen. I could, we don't have time to go through all the physics of it. Uh, and, you know, output of energy by weight, com gasoline compared to batteries and the pollution of batteries and the fact that, you, you know, you, you got to, we don't have the charging stations. And even if we did, where's that electricity coming from? Oh, coal. It will never happen. But meanwhile, they're destroying the U.S. economy in pursuit of an ideological point that will never actually happen. Another example of propaganda versus reality. You know, narratives are power powerful, but reality is more powerful. Disinflation, definitionally, but maybe even deflation is, is the opposite, at least for the time being. Inflation is the end game. It has to be because there's no way uh, out from under the debt. But right now, and people are still worried about inflation. Prices are still going up. I, I put gas in my car just like everyone else. So I'm well aware of it, eggs, bacon, you know, et cetera. But inflation has been coming down steadily since uh, June of, uh, of 2022. So uh, about seven months in a row, eight months in a row, um, it you know, peaked then. Uh, we all know what gas prices were doing and so forth. But the reason is, is kind of interesting. And inflation, uh, nominally, yeah, prices are going up. Okay, so that's inflation. But it can come from two sources that are opposite. One is from uh, supply side shocks, supply chain disruption. We saw that in 1973 with the Arab oil embargo over the Arab-Israeli war at the time, the price of oil quadrupled, et cetera. That was a supply shock. The thing about supply side inflation is it's self-negating. It burns itself out. So, you know, the old uh, saying, and it's true, the, the cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. In other words, when things get too expensive because of supply disruption, People can't afford them, businesses close, you get layoffs, you go into recession, and prices come down pretty quickly after that. The other source of inflation is from the demand side, and this is a completely different dynamic. We saw this in the late 70s, where um, uh, you know prices are going up, but people have some bargaining power, so unions are on strike, they're getting higher wages. Uh, I, mean, I worked at Citibank in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. They used to give us raises without asking. They just say, here, here's another $20,000, because they knew that the cost of living was going up. We would all change jobs if they didn't pay us more. So, but that, uh, that feeds on itself. So the supply side disruption tends to snuff itself out. The demand side inflation tends to feed on itself. It gets out of control. And then we saw what Paul Walker did with interest rates in 1980, 1981, where he took them to 20%. He, he caused a recession in terms of tight monetary policy to snuff out the inflation. But otherwise, if you don't do that, that just runs away. Now, this, the inflation we saw in 2022, late 2021, 2022, it was real. It wasn't transitory the way Jay Powell said. Um, and, you know, the price of gasoline doubled, more than doubled. Uh, and all the other complaints you hear, uh, you know, the filling up your Ford F-150 uh, pickup truck went from uh, $70 to $140, which for a lot of people that meant they couldn't eat or couldn't you know, go out. It was killing demand mm -hmm. in you know, entertainment, shopping, uh, retail, uh, a lot of other things, which again, tends to snuff it out. So that has happened to, to a great extent. Starting in June uh, 2022, that was the peak and this inflation has been coming down. Now, it's still too high. The Fed's not done. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna see um, at least one more interest rate hike um, maybe, but they're going to leave one more on the table. We'll see what happens in June. I'm not forecasting June, but I would not rule out another interest rate hike in June after the May hike. So, um, 
because they, and they, Jay Powell's like thinking, how many times do I have to say this? He's given nine speeches since August 2022, August 26th at the Jackson Hole, then September FOMC meeting, uh, November FOMC meeting, um, the end of November, a speech at the Brookings Institution, December FOMC, congressional testimony, you know, et cetera. And every time he said the same thing, inflation is job one. We, uh, you know, we, we've got to get unemployment up, believe it or not. They, they, you know, we're going to have a recession and unemployment is going to go up. Sorry about that. But, <laughs> we, but we've got to get inflation under control. And until we do, and that's, what's under control mean? Well, it's 2%. That's their goal. Well, it's, it's come down from 9 to 5. Nice job. But 5 is still a far cry from 2. And it gets harder as you go along. Um, and they're searching for what they call the terminal rate. So the terminal rate, no one knows what the number is. Uh, I don't know because Jay Powell doesn't know. But, um, but the terminal rate, by definition, is it's a rate that's high enough that it brings inflation down on its own without further rate hikes. Um, because so far, they've been raising rates and inflation's been coming down. Okay, that makes sense. And they can keep raising rates and it'll come down more. But is there a level where, you know, we're, uh, we're there, now we can sit tight, the famous pause, and inflation will keep coming down? Mm -hmm. Now you don't know, because it's not a controlled experiment. You can't, like, do it twice. But they're getting close. So whether it's five and a quarter, five and a half, remains to be seen. But that's the terminal rate. But then, Wall Street came up with this narrative, oh yeah, as soon as we're done hiking rates, they're going to cut them. Um, that, this is the famous pivot we've been hearing about for uh, over a year uh, at this point. No, as far as they're concerned, forget rate cuts in 2023. Maybe mid-2024, you know, we'll get back to you on that. Um, but there's one wild card in the deck, which is, that's the Fed's plan. So I just gave you the Fed's game plan. And it's not, you know, you don't need a crystal ball. They tell you what they're going to do. All you have to do is listen, although a lot of people don't. Wall Street makes up their own version of that. Uh, but, uh, but the idea of rate cuts following hitting the terminal rate is, well, rate cuts go down, so dividends are higher, so buy stocks. You know, Wall Street is always buy stocks. That's, the, that's always the punchline. But they might cut rates late in the year, not because it's their plan, not because they want to, but we could be in a very severe recession. Uh, and that, at which point, because the Fed's always late, to, you know, they're, they're always following the market, they never leave the market. Mm -hmm. If they've already raised, let's say they may already be at the terminal rate and not know it. Um, and so if they keep raising, which I expect they will, uh, they may throw this economy into a very severe recession, at which point they may have to cut rates, not because it's in the playbook, but because, you know, unemployment goes up to 7%. And, uh, but that gets back to the, the, the first question, Constantine, which is what's next? Disinflation may be deflation. The answer is diversification. Everyone goes, oh, we, we know that, you know, diversification. But... Uh, they know the term, but they actually don't know what diversification is. And I'll give you an example. I run into people all the time. They go, well, Jim, I'm fully diversified. I have 50 stocks in 10 different sectors, telecommunications, semiconductors, consumer non-durables, metals and mining. And I go, you're not diversified. You may have 50 stocks, but you're in one asset class called stocks or equities. And they're all going to go up together or they're all going to go down together. And the more stressful the condition, the more reason you have to be concerned about it, the higher the correlation. You know, on any given day, some stocks go up and some stocks go down. But when you dial the stress meter up, they all tend to move together. So that's, I don't care about your 50 stocks, your 10 sectors, that's not diversified. So what does real diversification look like? Have a sleeve of equities if you want, that's fine. I would say um, I look hard at oil and natural gas, natural resources, agriculture. Again, kind of equities that have hard assets behind them that will do well in inflationary times mm -hmm. or even in recessionary times because you need all those things uh, no matter what. Um, then a slice of real estate. You know, I wouldn't be in commercial real estate, but you know, residential real estate, um, income producing real estate, farms, et cetera, that's good. Um, I have a big slug of cash. And people go, well, cash doesn't have any yield. Well, lately the yields, you can get uh, two, three percent, you know, on like a CD. Uh, but even in a simple, um, savings account, um, you know, it, it is quite low. It's, it's kind of less than 1%. But people don't understand the value of cash in a couple of respects. Number one, in a deflationary environment, we're not there yet, but we could hit that if the recession gets bad enough, cash could be your best performing asset. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go up in nominal terms, but it goes up in real terms. Mm -hmm. If you have 2% deflation, your cash is worth 2% more uh, in terms of purchasing power. But the, but the real value of cash is optionality. Mm -hmm. And this is not well understood. I shared an office with Myron Scholes uh, for six years, so I see options under the pillow, <coughs> so to speak. But uh, um, if you're the one with cash, 
when things, first of all, uh, it'll definitely preserve wealth. So if things are falling all around you, your cash will be what it's worth, unless you're in Silicon Valley Bank. It's a separate issue. But um, although they got bailed out. Uh, but so it'll preserve wealth, even if it's not a high, high performer. It'll do very well in deflation. But the real benefit is when everything else is falling apart, you're the one who can go shopping. So it's kind of an at-the-money call option on every asset class in the world. You know, everyone's selling everything in a panic. You can bide your time, watch it go down, look for a bottom, and then say, okay, now I'll, I'll buy these things down 30% or 40% or 50% from where they were. Um, some alternatives, I, um, uh, you know, I have a number of investments in uh, you know, private equity and venture type situations, and yeah, they're risky, uh, and they're not liquid, uh, but um, some of them will do very well, some of them have done well, so that's nice. Um, and then a slice of gold, uh, and I recommend 10%, because uh, people, you know, they put words in your mouth, they go, Jim Rickard says, sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that, not a good strategy. But 10%, yeah. The supply chain breakdown is causing a lot of the inflation we see. And everyone's like, wait a second, why are you talking about deflation? That's coming next. People are not ready for it. I know the inflation's here. I buy gasoline. I, I shop in the grocery store. I get it. I'm not, it it's, and it's persistent. It's not transitory. I understand all that. But inflation has two major sources. One is the supply side, which is called cost push inflation. So that's energy price shocks, fertilizer shortages, strategic metal shortages, component suppliers who can't deliver stuff to factories in Germany and they're shutting down, et cetera. The other cause is from the demand side, and that's called demand pull inflation, basically psychological. Consumers pull demand forward. They're like, hey, I was thinking of buying a refrigerator. I better buy it today because the price is going to go up in six months. We will now bring you clips from the interview. Please watch, share, and like this video. Also, Ensure you subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and share your thoughts about the video in the comments section below. Thanks and enjoy the video. The renowned economist Jim Rickards continued her speech as follows. In the 70s, we had both. It started with cost push with the Arab oil embargo, but it ended up demand pull. Um, I was starting my career at the time. Your boss would just give you a raise. You didn't even have to ask. You know, inflation was gone up so fast. Like, I better give this guy a raise. It gives another, you know, 30,000 bucks or whatever, because people would quit, you know, and that sort of spun out of control until Volcker squashed it all. Right now, we do not have demand pull inflation. We do have cost push inflation. The difference is, is hugely important because cost push inflation from the supply side it's real, prices go up, but it's self-negating. You know, the old saying that, you know, the cure for higher oil prices is higher oil prices because when they get too high, people stop driving. They shut down various activities. By the way, if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gasoline because you're not going anywhere. I mean, that's, that's kind of a nasty way of putting it, but that's, that's how the cost push inflation tips into a recession and then prices come down. And we saw that in 1974, you know, you had Jerry Ford and Alan Greenspan walking around with their, they had these wind buttons, WIN, which stood for whip inflation now, except we had a recession and prices collapsed. Now it came back by 77 for a lot of reasons, but right now we don't have demand pull, we have cost push. It will go away when this economy goes into recession. And then we're gonna be talking about disinflation and deflation, which are, you know, kind of close cousins. And the Fed's going to be out on a limb as usual, raising rates in the face of a, a recession and a price collapse. Uh, I don't know if the, what the recession is the cure for. It's coming. I mean, the yeah, recession is coming. But and Jay Powell said this. I mean, Jay Powell gave two speeches: August 26th, Jackson Hole, and September 21st at the press conference after the FOMC meeting that day. Uh, and the September 21st speech was almost like, well, just in case you weren't listening to me in Jackson Hole, let me tell you again what's happening. And then Jackson Hole, he was like, Nancy Pelosi, he tore up a speech and wrote a new one, like literally the day before. It was three or four pages. It was really short. He used the word pain three times in one paragraph. I've been following Fed news for 45 years. I've never seen the word pain ever. But he basically said the same thing. But September 21st, he was even more blunt. He said, there's going to be a recession. It's going to be bad. Unemployment is going to go up. Get it, you know, get it straight. These things are going to happen. And that's what it's going to take to get inflation under control. But he went on and on about how inflation was job one because the Fed has this dual mandate, which never made sense, but it's the law. I mean, Humphrey Hawkins, the dual mandate is price stability and low unemployment. 
those two things don't always go together. And sometimes you got to make trade-offs between the two. But right now, the trade-off is very easy, which is unemployment's really low. Now, I don't put much weight on it, but the Fed does. Again, put your Fed hat on. Unemployment's really low. If unemployment went from three point, I think it's at 3.5 at the moment, if it went to four and a half, uh, 4.9, is that the end of the world? Well, that was considered pretty low in 2000 you know, 13 when they were doing QE4 or whatever. So they're willing to do that. And they also think the recession, if it comes, will be mild. But those two things together will get inflation under control. The renowned economist Jim Rickards continued her speech as follows. I, in the statement from Pal, indicated he didn't express that. Where, I mean, their focus is on the core PCE, you know, the Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index, core, meaning excluding food and energy, and everyone's like, why would you exclude food and energy? Once again, I'm not here to argue about it. That's their approach. They aim to achieve a 2% core PCE annually. Pal didn't mention that we're going to increase rates until core PCE is 2%. He didn't say that. What he stated was that we'll raise rates until it has a constraining effect on inflation and inflation will naturally decrease because rates will be sufficiently high to prompt that, at which point we, the Federal Reserve, will pause. Then you ask, well, when will you lower rates? He was like, the pause could last a year. So, you're talking. T.W. Let go of this Fed policy change nonsense. I mean, you're talking about 2024 before they reduce rates. It's similar to what I recall from Vietnam, the old saying, you know, we had to devastate the village to preserve it. We have to damage the economy to rescue it. This is the most recent in a long series of Federal Reserve missteps since 1913. It seems to be their specialty, but that's what they're doing. And on top of all that, there's an impending global liquidity crisis, a worldwide financial crisis that differs from a recession. It's a financial panic, and recessions are distinct events. They can occur independently. In 1998, we had a financial panic, but there was no recession. In 1990, we had a recession, but there was no financial panic. In 2008, we had both. They can coincide. It appears they might be coinciding again. This is evident in inverted yield curves. Major dealers are competing in auctions for treasury bills. The Fed will provide you with treasury bills with a single phone call. All you have to do is contact the Fed and conduct a reverse repo. They'll provide you with some treasury bills. However, banks are bidding in auctions for treasury bills that yield a maturity lower than what the Fed will provide with a phone call. Why would they do that? The explanation is that the Fed bills cannot be rehypothecated, they cannot be used as collateral. However, the auctioned bills can. This indicates there's a collateral shortage. This implies reducing balance sheets, financial distress. And we also observe it not only in the Treasury yield curve, which is inverted from 6 months to 10 years at present but also in the Eurodollar futures curve, which is even more concerning. It's not unprecedented, but it is rare, and it's not a good sign. Nevertheless, the Fed persists in raising rates despite this extremely unfavorable data. So, I anticipate a significant recession in the US, and the global outlook is fairly grim. Moreover, there's the possibility of a global financial liquidity crisis worse than 2008. If all I've said is accurate, which I believe it is, or I wouldn't be stating it, they could, at the very least, take a break now or even reduce rates. But if we're on the brink of a global liquidity crisis, as indicated by the Eurodollar futures curve and the Treasury yield curve, and negative swap spreads and treasury bill auctions with a yield at maturity below what the Fed will provide with a phone call. I mean, all these developments are taking place. That's hard data, and it's a very, very concerning sign. Less evident in 2008, incidentally, prior to the Lehman Brothers collapse. So, with the economy naturally entering a recession, along with the brewing global liquidity crisis, why on earth is the Fed raising rates at all? That's unsustainable. So I foresee a more severe recession. That's one aspect, combined with Fed tightening, interest rate increases, balance sheet reductions, and so on. 
That's one whole dimension, and I wouldn't place much weight on a low unemployment rate. It disregards the labor force participation rate, which is abysmal. You know, it's around 62%, compared to 70% in the year 2000. However, unemployment is a lagging indicator. Unemployment rises after a recession begins. Employers are very reluctant to lay off employees. You have to pay severance. Recruiting and rehiring them and providing training is costly. Employers typically wait until the recession has already commenced, and they say, oh, well, I have to lay off some people. So it's not a leading indicator, it's a lagging one. Don't forget to like our video and subscribe for our channel. The Fed will not be able to get interest rates to 5% without causing recession, not to mention the impact on the deficit and a lot of other things. So the Fed can't escape the room. So if inflation stays where it is, the Fed can't get interest rates to a real level uh, without causing a recession, which will sink the stock market. But if even if inflation comes down a little bit, that'll be a sign of recession. So you're raising rates into a recession, which will cause a recession. You end up in a recession either way. Um, it's just a question of whether the Fed persists or throws in the towel. Now, we've seen this movie before. What's going on is an exact replay of what happened between 2013 and 2019. May 2013, Bernanke announces the taper. Expectation is they're going to start the taper in September. He chickens out. They start the taper in November 2013. They finish the taper in November 2014. And here comes Yellen. She's going to raise rates. Take out the word patient from the, from the statement. She doesn't raise rates until December 2015. And then she doesn't raise them again until December 2016. They went a whole year between two 25 basis point rate cuts. And then here comes Powell and then boom, okay, 25 basis points, boom, boom, boom. Gets them up to two and a quarter, which is where they want it to be. And gets the balance sheet down to about three and a half trillion. They want to get it down to about two and a half trillion. But he's, he's got rates about where he wants them. He's got the balance sheet on its way down. Uh, and uh, he's normalizing. And what happens? The stock market crashes 20% between October 1st, 2018 and December 24th, 2018. That was the famous Christmas Eve massacre where the stock market fell 3% in one day. But the Fed's still tightening. The Fed tightened like a week before the Christmas Eve massacre. They tightened into the weakness. They were getting very close to crashing the stock market. They took it down 20% in three months, getting close to crashing. And so what happens next? First week of January, Powell comes out. Okay, we're not going to raise interest rates anymore. We're going to be patient. They use all these code words. We're going to be patient. Then he starts cutting rates. Then he starts QE. I forget if it's eight or nine, whatever. Lost, lost track of QE. He starts QE eight, let's say. And then that takes you into 2020. And here comes the pandemic and rates go down to zero and the balance sheet goes to seven trillion dollars. They were back where they were in May of 2013. Except worse, because now the balance sheet was even bigger than it was then. A complete failure. So who thinks they're going to be more successful this time? They're doing the same thing. It's going to happen faster this time because the market saw that whole seven-year fiasco from May to 2013 to May 2020, a seven-year round-trip failure. The same thing's going to happen, but it's going to happen faster this time because like, the market knows that the Fed doesn't know what they're doing. So the Fed's tightening into weakness. One of two things is going to happen. And it's not clear which, but it's going to be one or the other. They're going to keep tightening and keep tightening and keep tightening, try to get a handle on inflation and crash the stock market. Or they're going to lose their nerve, back off on the tightening, and then inflation is just going to rip, which will also crash the stock market. So take your pick, but um, it's going to be one or the other. But this idea of a soft landing is nonsense. The 2021 thesis was that, you know, inflation grew. Part of it was base effects because, you know, the, the way the government calculates inflation, it's monthly data compared to the year before. So it's year over year, monthly, then annualized. Uh, and so one could easily explain inflation in April, May, June 2021 because you were comparing it to 2020, which was the worst 
recession since 1946. But the base effects would run off uh, in September, October, November. But the inflation persisted, even though the base effects were gone. So now it's like, okay, this is real inflation. It's coming from somewhere else. It was coming from the supply chain, which the Fed can't do anything about either because the Fed doesn't drill for oil. They don't build pipelines and they don't grow wheat. The Fed can't do anything about any of those things. And that's where um, the war and the sanctions and the continuation of COVID played a role. So, you know, I say you can, you can have your own uh, views, but you can't have your own data. The data is clear. The inflation is here. The supply chains are getting worse. But these supply chain disruptions didn't start with the war. They didn't even start with the pandemic. They started with Trump's trade war beginning in 2018. I found a very good book on that uh, written by um, uh, Lauren LaRocco. Uh, and what's interesting about her book is that she finished it in late 2019. So it's almost like a controlled experiment. It was pre-pandemic. It's easy to say that the pandemic disrupted the supply chain, which it did. And the war disrupted the supply chain, which it did. But here we have a very rigorous study of what was happening to supply chains before either one. And the answer is they were a mess. They were a mess back then because of tariffs on China and China redirecting soybean purchase orders from the United States to Brazil. That sounds easy because Brazil grows soybeans. Well, guess what? You got to get the ships to Brazilian ports. You got to rearrange all the logistics lanes. That was happening already. Pandemic made it worse. And now the war makes it uh, even worse than that. Yeah, the world is breaking up. Uh, we're decoupling. We're globalization is over. There'll be a new form of it. Uh, it's not the end of world trade, but you're going to see, you know, maybe the, the five eyes, you know, UK, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and friends in Western Europe form uh, a new trading bloc, but exclude China and Russia. It'll be a little bit more like the Cold War. I talked to Paul Walker about this, but here's what happened in the 70s. Now, it started as cost push inflation. It was the Arab oil embargo in 1973 after the 1973 war, the Israel Arab war. Uh, then the Arabs threw the embargo on us. The price of oil quadrupled. It went from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel. It sounds cheap, but I said 300% increase. And then uh, we had a severe stock market crash and recession in 1974, which at the time was the worst since the Great Depression. We've had worse ones since, but at the time, that was the worst recession since the Great Depression. Then we come out of that, and along comes the Fed, you know, and um, we went off the gold standard. Nixon uh, had an easy monetary policy in 72. It was a little earlier for his reelection effort, et cetera. So here comes the inflation. But what happened along the way, and then you had another Arab oil, actually an Iranian oil embargo in 1979 after the Ayatollah took over. So there were there were double oil shocks. That was a supply-driven cost push inflation. But along the way, it morphed into demand pull. It, it morphed into a demand-driven inflation. Now, I lived through it. I mean, I was a young up-and-coming lawyer at Citibank and a senior officer living in New York City. And that was the world where if you wanted anything, new furniture, TV set, vacation, whatever, you ran out, you dropped everything, ran out and did it because the price was going up so fast. So that's instructive in two ways. Number one, um, it shows that the Fed's always behind the curve. It shows that these things can persist a lot longer than people expect. But in my view, most importantly, because I think things are going to happen more quickly now, it shows inflation morphing from cost push to demand pull, morphing from something on the supply side to a psychological shift on the consumer side. And Volcker crushed it, but um, at a huge cost. Unemployment was uh, about 11 percent. He took interest rates to 20 percent. How does that feel? You know, mortgagors and student loan holders and uh, others, you know, 20 percent. You're talking about 40 percent on credit cards in that world. And people forget, you know, well, doesn't inflation, don't you have high growth or whatever, at least or low unemployment? No, we had stagflation. We had inflation and high unemployment. There were three recessions between 1974 and 1982. We had three, 1974, 1980, and 1981, which lasted until 1982. And by the way, uh, people lost confidence in the dollar. In the late 70s, Jimmy Carter's treasury issued what they call Carter bonds. The U.S. Treasury issued debt in Swiss francs. Now, it was treasury debt. You had the treasury credit, but it was denominated in Swiss francs because nobody wanted dollars. That's how bad things were. The narrow uh, focus I'd like to start with, since it's the topic of the day, is the dollar 
Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I'm going to throw red meat to the wolves here by uh, citing a headline across Bloomberg earlier from Larry Summers talking about how the dollar can continue to move higher because the U.S. has all these great fundamental advantages. This comes, you know, 24 hours after another Bloomberg headline talked about the unstoppable strength in the dollar. So there's the red meat for you, and I'll let you gnaw on that for a little bit. (laughs) Well, it may come as a surprise. I think I think Larry Summers was half right. And I've I've met him a number of times. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. He's always I I uh, I almost always agree with his analysis and then disagree with his policy. So I always have to stop halfway with Larry Summers. Like good analysis, Larry, but you're you're going going the wrong way. but yeah, I think he's right that the dollar will get strong uh, is probably correct. Also, where I disagree, and this is critical, is the reason why. The dollar is getting stronger for some very bad reasons, meaning bad in terms of the macro economy, what's, what probably lies ahead, what is probably telling us. Um, so let's just maybe step back and not be Larry Summers for a minute, but just be everyday investors and asset allocators and analysts and and say, um, and I hate to use the word conundrum because Greenspan used it, but conundrum is a fancy way of saying I don't really understand what's going on. But um, but this is a conundrum for a lot of people because they look at it, the US objectively, okay, our, our debt to GDP ratio is over 130%, highest in US history, um, tons of research coming from um, obviously Ken Rogoff, but really Carmen Reinhardt, Vincent Reinhardt and others, but many others, not just them, that says um, at those debt to GDP ratios, you um, you can't grow. Uh, you, you can maybe refinance and muddle through, but it always ends either in um, default, which is unlikely because we can print the money, that much is true, or um, extreme inflation where here's your trillion dollars back, good luck buying a loaf of bread. So. We'll we'll see how that plays out. But what, the way it's playing out in real time is that the U.S. Uh, uh, economic growth is incredibly weak. So we've got high, uh, sky high debt to GDP ratio. By the way, when you look at other countries in the world, you say, okay, who who's at that lunch table? You know, 130 percent. The answer is Lebanon, Greece, uh, Italy. The, those are your those are your, your lunch partners, so to speak. And this not, is not like a, the scene from Animal House. Would you like to meet Clayton, yeah. Jugdash, and Muhammad? <laughs> that's, that's a good that, that's a good comparison. Um, economic growth is weak. Uh, we're in a recession. I don't care what Janet Yellen says. I don't consider her expert on the topic. But we've had our two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Like it or not, that's the definition of recession. Um, the fact that the National Bureau of Economic Research which is a private group, by the way, but they're the recognized referees on recessions and recoveries. The fact that they haven't said so doesn't mean anything because they never do say so until you know nine months or a year um, after it happened. And for that matter, most recessions are two quarters, some three, some have been longer, but but most recessions are a couple of quarters. The, the National Bureau of Economic Research usually declares a recession after it's already over. Like it started, it happened, it's over, we're in recovery. And they go, oh, by the way, we had a recession last January. <laughs> um, okay, so they'll probably get back to us, I, I would bet heavily after the election, but um, uh-huh. we'll, we'll, we'll hear from them at some point. But we're in a recession now and people say, what about the third quarter? Um, and it's interesting because I do, put some weight on the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I, I do think it's a very good tool. It's, it, they miss sometimes, they're not always accurate, but it's the best tool out there. But very few people understand their statistical technique. Because uh, what Wall Street does, uh, you, you get a whole bunch of components uh, for GDP and they come in at different times with different lags and you add them all up and you get GDP. Um, and what Wall Street does, they look at what they have and they project all the rest based on regressions and correlations, which, you know, don't necessarily hold up. But this, okay, here's what we think. Here's our forecast for third quarter GDP based on uh, projections of what we don't know. Atlanta doesn't do that. Atlanta takes what we do know, hard data, and they ask a different question. They say, what would GDP be now if this was all we had? And they put out a number. But uh, they don't guess at the stuff they don't have. And it fills in as it goes along. So it's much more Bayesian in that sense. Um, but because of how the data comes out, the, the time sequence to which the data comes out, it typically fades as the quarter goes on. It's not because they're using a uh, bad methodology. It's just because that's how they do it. Yeah. Um, and so just in the last uh, week, nine days or so, it went, you know, everyone was cheering. I think with, uh, September 1st, it was 2.3%, maybe a little higher, but about 2.3%. Two days later, it was 
1.6 and now it's down to 1.3. So it's following that pattern, I would expect by the end of September, we still got three weeks to go, given what I said about how it fades, it, it, it doesn't have to be negative, but it could very well be negative, maybe three quarters of decline in GDP, but whatever it is, it's going to be weak. So if it's positive, you know, two tenths or three tenths, I mean, that's okay, but you're still rounding our way from recession. It doesn't mean the problem's over. So uh, debt to GDP is sky high, economy weak at best, probably had a recession in the first half. Maybe that's continuing. Um, People talk unemployment close to an all-time low, went up a little bit in the last report. Yeah, but even at 3.5% or so, uh, that that is extremely low. I mean, I go back to the 1960s and uh, that was that was low, low by the measures of the 1960s. But that completely ignores probably eight to 10 million Americans who were, were perfectly able of having jobs and working, um, prim, you know, prime age, 25 to 54 years old, who are not in the workforce. Yeah. Um, that's that's that measure is picked up in labor force participation rate, which is uh, uh, low. I mean, that was that peaked around 70 percent in 19 sorry in 2000, uh, main, up from the 1970s, and that was women coming into the workforce and other factors. Uh, but now it's down to around 62 percent and change it ticked up a little bit in the last report but it's still extremely low it's never 100 i mean there's always you could be um, a homemaker a, a student um they're they're uh retired early retirees there are a lot of reasons people aren't in the workforce but not you know taking 10 percent off or 14 percent decline uh from the starting place in um uh over 20 years that's uh so if you, if you throw those people into the un they're not called unemployed because they're not looking for jobs but if you threw them in, unemployment would be closer to 10%, which is a recession or a depression level, actually. Um, so, and, and I could go on, but the point is there, there are all kinds of signs of weakness. So, you know, <laughs> if we have the deficit, uh, where, um, you know, the baseline deficit is a trillion, that's before uh, an extra two trillion for Trump's COVID relief, uh, an extra two, three trillion for Biden's COVID relief, if you include the, uh, a ludicrously named Inflation Reduction Act right. uh, and, and, you know, and, and the American Rescue Act and uh, the Infrastructure Act. Call it what you want. It's it's still three to four trillion. Yeah. Two for Trump. That's six on top of two baseline. That's eight trillion dollars in two years. So your deficit's out of control and your trade deficit's out of control. So what's not to like? Um, and yet you, you look at all that. You say, well, "What are you kidding me? I mean, get me out of the dollar. Get me go get anything else." Uh, why is the dollar so strong? And the answer is for this, you have to go behind the curtain. You have to look into the, what's called the plumbing of the international monetary system. And I had a discussion, um, and this goes back, this is 1980. Uh, so I'm a you know, an up, young, up and coming vice president of Citibank. That's back, uh, back in the days when it was a bank before they turned it into a hedge fund. Uh, so <laughs> I'm, I'm like a 27 or whatever, a 28 maybe year old lawyer. Um, but I'm, I'm talking to Walter Riston. It's you know, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. He was, mm -hmm. for those who don't know the name or don't recall, he was probably the second greatest banker of the 20th century after Pierpont Morgan. So I'll give Morgan the prize, uh, yeah. but he, he left around 1910. Uh, but, um, and Riston was the inventor of the Euro dollar. Oh, so the, the negotiable certificate of deposit, Euro dollars are around a little bit earlier, but he took the CD that, that, that was your interest in the Euro dollar and made them negotiable and tradable. Um, so I'm having a conversation with him and I, I had just seen this movie which I highly recommend as Chris Christopherson, Hume Cronin and Jane Fonda. It's called Rollover. Uh, and it's again, 1980, but all-star cast. Yeah, I got a murder mystery, a little sex tone in, but it's uh, it's basically about the collapse of confidence in the US dollar. And Hume mm -hmm. Cronin plays the Walter Riston part. Um, and basically the idea was the, remember this is during the, the Arab oil embargoes and the Iranian oil embargo and price of oil quadrupled in eight years and all that. So the, the theme was the, the Arabs are taking the money out of the banking system and buying gold and they're stashing the gold away. And this is the, the collapse of the financial system. And that was sort of the plot. So I said, you know, uh, and Mr. Riston, uh, uh, what about that? You know, everyone took their money out of the system and uh, bought gold. Wouldn't that collapse the system? And he looked at me like I was a new kid on the block, which I was. And he said, well, what you have to understand is that you can take your money out of the bank and you can buy gold. 
but the person who sold you the gold got the money and they put it back in the bank so it doesn't go anywhere it's a closed <laughs> circuit and of course now i'm like oh oh yeah you're right of course he's right um and he said so the the uh, stability of the system doesn't depend on who sells what for dollars yeah it affects exchange rates a little bit and um and interest rates with the price of gold but he said the money always it can't literally disappear it has to go back into the system it's a closed circuit and of course that's how the euro dollar system works